the question is, what makes it rain? Here are a few questions that go along with this. What are the mechanisms that lead to formation of precipitation? What do we mean when we talk about a lapse rate? How would you go about determining the lapse rate? Where would you get the data to uh, determine the local lapse rate? And what's an example of the orographic effect? Let's take a look at some basic principles. First of all, rising air masses reach dew point temperatures or can reach dew, dew point temperatures in part because as they rise, they cool. When cooling occurs, and when cooling is sufficient to reach the dew point temperature, droplets form around condensation nuclei. These are very small, between a tenth and 10 microns in diameter, and they could consist of things like ash, nitrogen oxides, and salt particles. Initially, only a slight upward force uh, air movement is sufficient to count counteract uh, gravitational force. So as droplets size grows, uh, gravity overcomes the force exerted by upward air movement and drops reverse the direction and fall to Earth. But this all depends upon condensation occurring to the point where a sufficient volume and a sufficient mass have been developed to actually overcome the gravitation or the uh, upward force inside of clouds and cause raindrops to fall out. How do air masses rise? In part, this can happen when we have unheating, uneven heating of air masses at the surface or cooling at the top that causes a rise. We can have denser air flows in at the surface that force uh, air uh, in an up, upward direction, uh, causing cooling as it ascends. The kind of cooling that we're talking about is called adiabatic cooling. And adiabatic cooling and rapid upward rise of air masses is what is responsible for thumber, summer thunderstorms. In this case, we have masses of air or volumes of air that are enriched with water vapor and, and heated as well. And as they're enriched with water vapor and heated, they begin to rise. And as they rise, they begin to cool. And sooner or later, if they reach a point, an elevation, at which the temperature inside of the air mass reaches, or the volume of air reaches the dew point, condensation can occur, provided that we have condensation nuclei in place. So in general, as air masses rise, they may start out as warmer than the surrounding air masses, but they eventually, because of their water content, cool, and cooling can lead to condensation. And as they rise, they're displaced, uh, they displace uh, air, and we have air from surrounding areas rushing in as wind. So how do we estimate the lapse rate? Well, we can use ambient temperature measurements. The lapse rate is the change in temperature with change in elevation. So it can't just be any ambient temperature measurement. We need differential temper uh, temperature measurements at different altitudes. There are several kinds of adiabatic lapse rates. With the dry adiabatic lapse rate, temperature changes occur by compression and the expansion of air. The super adiabatic lapse rate is usually caused by intense solar heating at the surface. And this usually occurs when the, uh, in the summer when skies are clear, wind speeds are low, and soils are dry and there's not much evaporative cooling taking place. The dry adiabatic lapse rate is about a change in one degree centigrade, so minus one degree centigrade per hundred meter of rise. We can get information about the current adiabatic lapse rate by going to a website maintained by the University of Wyoming that records the results of every single 
balloon ascension, weather balloon ascension in the United States and actually in other cooperating weather stations, uh, including Central America and South America. The weather station for Reno is located near the Desert Research Institute and the symbol for that is REV. What happens with a balloon launch is that an instrument cluster attached to a balloon is propelled upward by the balloon and it takes readings, constant readings as it ascends. Sooner or later what happens is the balloon reaches a maximum elevation where the balloon erupt or the broom balloon breaks and drops the um, instrument cluster back to the surface of the earth. We can plot those data using Excel, bringing them into Excel using the right click button on the report that we get from the website. And a plot, this one from the 7th of September at 4 o'clock in the morning, looks like this. Now it's important to note that these balloons are sent off twice a day on at noon and midnight Greenwich Mean Time. Here that represents 4 o'clock in the morning and 4 o'clock in the afternoon, local time. But we can see a couple of things in looking at this graph. This is a graph of the estimated dew point and the temperature. First of all, the dew point and the temperature are never together, which simply means that condensation can't occur because cooling is not sufficient to drop the internal air mass, or uh, internal temperature of the, of the air, uh, to the point where condensation could occur given the um, conditions that we're measuring with this balloon. In fact, if condensation were occurring, we'd see a convergence of the temperature and the dew point lines. We can also see, though, as we go upward in elevation, and our elevation change is, is from about uh, 1,700 or so meters to nearly 1,600 meters, or more than 1,600 meters, uh, we can see that there's almost a regular line going from where the balloon was released to where it eventually failed. So, uh, the uh, the uh, adiabatic lapse rate on this particular day, which is the 7th, was negative 0.57 degrees centigrade per 100 meter of rise. So for every 100 meters of rise we, we had, it dropped about a, a little bit more than a half a degree centigrade. And that's based on the beginning point, which is 15, 16 meters, where it was 18 degrees centigrade, and the end point, which was 16,640 meters, with a temperature of negative 68.3 degrees centigrade. We subtract one from the other and divide it by the change in, and divide it by the change in elevation and uh, do the uh, subtraction uh, beginning from end and you'll come up then with and then multiply that times 100 and we'll come up with the number of degrees change per 100 meters of rise. This is one example of how lifting releases rainfall. When we have a warm front that's intruding on a cold front. Cold air is less dense than warm air. As the warm front intrudes on the cold front, the warm front essentially climbs up on top of the cold air mass, almost like it's floating. And as it climbs, it cools. And as it cools, it may reach dew point and if there are condensation nuclei present, it begins to release rainfall from condensation uh, as, a fr as a process of, of uh, interaction between two different kinds of fronts. We may also have precipitation due to an intruding cold front. Here, a more dense air mass intrudes upon a less dense air mass, again, pushing the less dense air mass, the warm air, up into the air Causing, uh, causing the rise of, of warm air parcels, and then because of the resulting cooling, uh, and if there is, again, the um, condensation nuclei present, uh, causing the release, the condensation and the release of precipitation as the warm air front es essentially is forced to rise by the intrusion of the cold air, fr cold air front. 
There's also a phenomenon called orographic lifting, which is particularly important here in the Sierra Mountains and on this side of the Sierras. Here we have uh, air currents that are forced to climb over mountain ranges like the Sierras. As they climb, they cool. As they cool, condensation can occur, and as condensation can occurs, we have precipitation. The interesting thing to note about this, though, is that in this cartoon, precipitation is happening very close to, this, to the uh, peak of the mountain range. And as we descend on the other side of the mountain range, essentially, air masses warm, and as they warm, they increase their capacity to hold water. And because they increase their capacity to hold water, the relative humidity goes down. Condensation is very unlikely to occur, which is, accounts for the rain shadow effect on the leeward side of mountain raises. The islands in Hawaii are a perfect example of this. This is the island of Oahu. The spine of mountains that runs from the north to the south on the eastern side of the island intercepts the trade winds as they blow across the Pacific Ocean. Accordingly, we see a massive rainfall gradient between the areas that are uh, directly to the uh, windward side of the ridge tops and then areas that are farther out uh, on the island to the west. This is manifested in massive differences in rainfall amounts. If we look at the upper end of the Manoa watershed, which is the small watershed that's directly above Waikiki, we'd see that we have sometimes 10 feet of rain, whereas if we go further to the west, out from Pearl Harbor, uh, we have rainfall amounts that are more like those that we see in Nevada. So there's a huge gradient of rainfall from the ridge tops to the areas to the west, and mostly because of this orographic effect that's forcing moisture release on the eastern side of the island. So back to the questions. What are the mechanisms that lead to formation of precipitation? Well, they include uh, lifting of one sort or another, whether it's orographic lifting or convective lifting because of changes in temperature, or lifting because one uh, air mass encounters another and there's a differential density. The lapse rate refers to the change in temperature with elevation. and it's usually expressed in uh, per 100 meters. We would determine the lapse rate by having the temperature at a given elevation, uh, say at the land surface, another temperature at another elevation, say uh, the upper end of the atmosphere, and then subtracting the two, um, change in temperature over change in elevation, and multiplying that times 100 because the convention is that we express the lapse rate, rate in terms of changes in degrees centigrade per 100 meter rise. We could get data to determine the uh, local lapse rate from the University of Wyoming's uh, website that records the results of all of the weather balloon launchings uh, from in the United States and from cooperators. And an example of the orographic effect would be uh, the uh, system that I showed in Hawaii on the island of Oahu, but a, an example that's much closer to home and is manifested in the distribution of precipitation across the Sierras is related to the Sierra Mountains and weather fronts that blow in from the Pacific Ocean and lose their moisture over the, as they pass over the ridge tops in the Sierra Mountains.